Okay, so today, um, because the exam is on Thursday, just a reminder, I shut down any discussion of the exam or any questions or anything um, 24 hours before the exam. So the exam will start at four o'clock on Thursday. Um, I can't remember how much time I said you could have, but I'm going to write like an hour and a half exam. And, you know, you guys can have, I, I don't care, um, let's say three hours. So as long as I get the exam answers back by seven, like, if you've done if you've done the stuff already, like you've done the assignments, you're in good shape. If you haven't done the assignments, you're screwed. So it's 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 pretty binary actually. So four o'clock tomorrow is my cutoff. Again, email or whatever by four o'clock tomorrow, I'll answer it. Um, if it's after that, I'm not answering it. And I'll try and get back to you as quickly as I can. I normally um, that will arrive in the middle of my group meeting, so I'll probably answer it Thursday morning. So I won't, I won't be able to answer it if you get it in right at the end of the day tomorrow. Okay, so I want to take a break from thinking about sugar chemistry and talk a little bit about um, sugar biochemistry. Now, I'm not a biochemist. Okay, I was hired as one, but I'm not really a biochemist. I lied. Out of the way. So really there's two main classes of enzymes that we need to think about when we're working with sugar. So we could talk about all the enzymes that are involved in the synthesis of glucose from pyruvate. Um, I'm still traumatized by a bunch of third year metabolism biochemistry classes that I took where I had to memorize this shit. And so I don't really want to do it. it it's a series of all all reactions. It's relatively straightforward. And there's not actually a lot of really interesting stuff going on. Instead, what I want to look at is kind of the complement to what we've been really focusing on. So we've been talking a lot about making disaccharides. And so the two classes of enzymes I want to talk about today are glycosidases. And glycosyl transferases. So I, I think a lot of you have quite a lot of biochemistry background. So what do these enzymes do? Just big picture based on the names. I can see that. Transfers glycols. Glycosyl groups. Okay, so glycosyl transferases transfers glycosyl groups. These are your anabolic enzymes. So the, these are making disaccharides, oligosaccharides. Hi, guys. Sorry, I'm a little late. That's okay. So the, the, this is the Zoom equivalent of like walking into the class and throwing your bag really loudly at the front is okay, coming in and talking about it. Oh, okay. No, you're very welcome to do it. It's a class of five people. That's the whole freaking point. Um, it's good to see you, Samra. Thanks, man. Um, so glycosyl transferases transfer glycosyl groups. So when we're thinking about when we're making a sugar, what we're effectively doing, we even call it that, we call it like a glycosyl donor. We're transferring a glycosyl group. So we're moving that around. So glycosidases, you got that A's termination, you know, proteases, RNases, RNAases. Um, these, you know, polymerase is the one that's a little weird because that's anabolic as well, you're making stuff. But glycosidases break down sugars. These are your metabolic, I guess catabolic. Which leads me back to that um, TikTok I started with with the cat. 
so the catabolic pro the, so, no it doesn't tie together at all it's got nothing to do with that I just couldn't stop laughing so um, catabolic process and breaking glycosidic bonds So there are large families of these. Glycosidases are actually the most common enzyme in your blood serum. You have a, you secrete a lot of glycosidases. So your blood serum is full of them. I think we mentioned this class number one. They're going around and they're just basically chipping away, scissoring off um, sugars on the surface of cells constantly. And so that's why you need to constantly replenish your cell surface sugars because they're constantly getting cut off by glycosidases in the blood uh, or in the extracellular fluid. Now, that's not a bug. That's not a bug. That's a feature. Like the whole idea of like of sugars. I think we started with this at the beginning of the class. Is that they offer you this medium-term signaling route, where the turnover happens on the order of hours. So. If you need a signal, if you need cells to do something for a few hours, sugars, sugar modification on the surface is a really good way to do it. And you know that those are going to get chopped up. So you can turn over your signal every few hours. You can change how the cells are responding to things. Okay. So, um, so these are most common serum enzyme. And depending on the glycosidase, um, they're very common. They're not the most common, no. There's, there are more proteases, stupid proteases. I'm going to be like a huge fan of proteases in a couple of lectures. But right now we're beating up on proteases because we're all about sugars. Uh, very common in the lysosome. And so the lysosome is your garbage disposal unit. Well, it's more of a recycling, really efficient recycling center inside each of your cells. Um, Vesicles from the surface get taken into the lysosome where they open up, they release their cargo, it gets chopped up, uh, and then you recycle the amino acids. But the lysosome also chops all the sugars off of things. And so there are a lot of glycosidases in there. So there are two main classes of glycosidases. And this is, again, why we're talking about this, because it's biochemistry, but it's still mechanism. There are inverting glycosidases and non-inverting. They could have called them retention glycosidases or something. Uh, I have no idea what I was trying to write. But no, they went with non-inverting. So in inverting glycosidase, alpha becomes beta, beta becomes alpha. And in non-inverting, alpha stays alpha, beta stays beta. Now, this is a purely, and I mean this, a purely academic distinction. It's about mechanism, because what you're making is you're making a re free reducing sugar. And again, just so we're using all the same terminology. This is called a reducing sugar if it has an OH at the anomeric position. If it doesn't, it is a non-reducing sugar. And that's because if you've got an OH at the anomeric position, remember that that's in fast equilibrium with the aldehyde and the aldehyde can be reduced. And so, if you don't have an OH, like if you have an, an ether there or something, it's not in equilibrium with the aldehyde. And so it cannot be reduced. So before we really understood all this stuff about what's actually going on there, we used to call these reducing sugars versus non-reducing sugars. Anyways, we're making reducing sugars. We're making free OHs. We're making hemiacetals, all the same words for different things. And we know that that's not stable. The beta becomes alpha. The alpha becomes beta by meter rotation, as it says on assignment one. 
So mechanistically, this is happening, but the end result is this reducing sugar, which then flips all back and forth. So that's something to keep in mind is it doesn't really matter that they're inverting or not inverting. Um, but it can matter when they are paired with a glycosyl transferase or a phosphorylase or something else. Uh, I guess it's a kinase that will stick a phosphate on it. So sometimes you can cleave and then immediately activate it again and turn it into a non-reducing sugar. And in that case, it, it can matter what you have. So let's just think about these mechanistically, how this goes. So one thing we didn't discuss very much, uh, well, no, it's, we didn't discuss it at all, is let's say you've got a sugar. You know, I'll make a nice boring sugar. Anyone know what this is? Sucrose? It's a polymer in this case. Cellulose? Glycogen. Starch. So let's say you have starch. You got a sugar. Now if I we haven't, we talked about making these bonds. We didn't talk about breaking these bonds. So if you're going to do this in the lab, if I said, look, here, here's like, you know, some starch, go make me some glucose from this. Um, what would you do? John, can you please repeat the question again? So let's say I gave you a bottle of starch, you know, corn starch. It's, it's just glycogen. And I say, ah, glycogen can be a little bit more complicated, but let's just go pure, glyco pure glycogen, pure, um, pure glucose polymer. Let's, and I say, turn, give me glucose out of this. Break these glycosidic bonds. And you have, you have a well-equipped chemical laboratory. How would you go about breaking glycosidic bonds? We haven't actually talked about this, but I think, most of you guys could probably answer it. Hydrolyze it? Yeah, okay. So how would you hydrolyze it? Well, because it's a polymer, it could not be as simple as, you know, mixing the sugar in the water. Nope, that would just That's dissolve something. it. Yeah, that would just So good. Susanna, add water. Yep, yep, yep. You need that to hydrolyze. Okay, so now you have starch dissolved in water. <laughs> but if starch, like, if that... You know, acid hydrolysis. Oh, it should be acid hydrolysis. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So I, I like that answer. So you take some starch, you take some water, you take a little bit of sulfuric acid, you heat the crap out of it. H plus heat water. I think I'm pushing on my keyboard on this tablet. So I'm going to actually pull my keyboard. And that hydrolyzes it. Like that is how you break up these bonds. So let's think about mechanistically what's happening there. So you've got H plus. Let's just change the color. So is there a specific terminology like deglycosylation or anything? Hmm. About breaking the sugars into its polymer? I guess animals? it's glycolysis. But glycolysis is kind of the biological process. Um, I would just call it hydrolysis of a sugar. <laughs> I think it's the technical neat. term. Um, you don't do it very often because you normally spend so much effort making these things. That being said, um, part of Paul's thesis that he's assiduously ignoring is to uh, deglycosylate a uh, natural product. Oh. So his work is on egg glycones? We're going to make an egg glycone. Yeah, he's working on egg glycones, and we need to make an egg glycone from something because the natural product has these sugars on them. We don't want the sugars. We want the sugars to come off, and we're going to replace them with um, a fake thing that isn't a sugar but has a lot of the benefits. It's more stable. Anyways, 
So mechanistically what happens here is you're going to protonate that ether oxygen. Now this oxygen is not any more basic really than any of the other oxygens on here. You could argue, I no, okay, you, you can argue and I will argue and it is true that an ether oxygen is slightly more basic than an alcohol. And that's because carbon is electron donating relative to hydrogen. So all else being equal, you got two carbons versus one carbon and a hydrogen, you're going to have more electron density on your oxygen. But, you know, we got a lot of, we got these guys as ether oxygens and yeah, that's true, but we're not talking a whole pKa unit. Like we're, whatever, it's about the same. It's just that if you protonate anything else, nothing really productive happens. But if you protonate here, oh, look, you've just made, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that we can draw on tablets. We've just made a protonated thing here. That is a leaving group at the anomeric position. Oxocarbenium. And your nucleophile, you're bathing this thing in water. And so water is your nucleophile. So that is, you know, how you break open a sugar. Now to do this, I, I we do need to take, you know, relatively strong acid and heat and time. Now, your cells are not in sulfuric acid and your cells are not heated to 100 degrees reflux uh, for, you know, six hours. So what I love about this is the one thing we haven't really talked about here, and again, we if you go all the way back to near the beginning of the whole course, we talked about, well, I, I'm cheating because what this needs to do is this needs to invert its conformation. You need to have that leaving group axial. So we're going to need to do a chair flip. This sugar is not really wanting to do a chair flip. It's glucose. It's it, or or make sort of a twist boat. This thing doesn't want to do that. It's very, very happy being glucose like this. So this is hard to do chemically. But of course, enzymes solve all the problems. So we're going to talk about an enzyme called hen egg white lysosome. Lysosome. This isn't even called a glycosidase. It is a glycosidase. What it is, is um, it cleaves chitin. It's a chitinase. It was actually the first protein to ever be analyzed by x-ray. Um, sorry, I think first enzyme, I think other proteins have been solved. It was the first enzyme and I just deleted some word. I don't know what that word was. I think it was glycosidase. Chitinase, it was chitinase. That's why I've written. So um, if you really want to read the paper, it's not necessarily reading. It's just if you want to take a look at how they used to talk about crystal structures, Nature in 1965, uh, page two, uh, volume 206, page 757. You know, Nature was already on volume 206 in 1965. That journal has been around for a long time. This is a non-inverting enzyme. So you go in with chitin.
So chitin is a glunac. And you come out like, I actually don't know how the determinant got the beta. Because again, as I was just saying, that converts immediately to alpha. So maybe you, I don't know if they're doing IR and they could sort of see that beta was formed, but I would think that the time frame of the existence of this stuff is so short, like the rotation is so fast. I really have no idea how they know that it was beta. Like there's tools we could use today, but not so much in 1965. And you come out with the, the beta. So beta goes to beta. So it's a non-inverting enzyme. But of course this happens at room temperature in a cell, a physiological pH like pH 6.4. So we've got to take this down to, you know, pH zero uh, 100 degrees and we can start cleaving it. Your body's doing this all the time. Even while you're trying to cleave stuff in a round bottom flask, you're setting up a reaction, your body's just happily doing the reaction. I never feel worse than this than when I'm trying to make peptides because I'm spending all this time making peptides in a peptide synthesizer and every single muscle movement I'm making, my body is making protein and peptide to do those muscle movements. And it's just mocking me. Anyways, what the way you do this, right? The way enzymes work is they are catalysts. So let's look at this process. Here's chitin. Here's glucose uh, and acetylglucose. I don't know really which way the energy is it's about the same, I would think. That's energy going up the y-axis and that's our reaction coordinate. So take chitin, heat it with acid and water. You know what, let's not even add acid in. So let's just make this Sorry. No, whatever I just did, don't undo. Um, let's just say this is just water at pH equals, I don't know. Let's make it slightly acidic, so 6.8. Pre-typical cellular physiological conditions, 37.5 degrees Celsius. So, if I take chitin, dissolve it in water at pH 6.8 here to 37.5 degrees, I'm going to have to wait till a very long time for the chitin to dissolve or uh, for the chitin to break up. Now your body's doing this very, very quickly. So how does a catalyst work? What, what, what's this enzyme doing? Reducing the activation energy. Absolutely. Okay. How do you reduce the activation energy? Um, by enzymes, I they actually. And okay, now we're going the, in a circle. Yeah. <laughs> enzymes reduce the activation energy, and you reduce the activated uh, energy by using enzymes. Okay. They, what is happening to my graph here to reduce the activation energy? Um, it's a stereochemical change. Uh, the shape of the molecule has been changed a bit by not, the enzyme. Yeah, okay, let's say conformational change, not stereotype. Yeah, conformational, sorry, yeah, okay, that's conformational the correct change. word. Conformational changes and that's uh, bringing the an overall energy of the molecule at the lower, lower point. And that's what enzyme does, I guess. Bringing what energy? Um, the overall energy of the molecule. Overall energy of the molecule. Yeah. I, okay, let's be very clear about exactly what we're talking about with molecules. So what enzymes do two things. We're actually gonna do both of them here. So as I said, we just drew chitin in its normal chair form. It's stable. The first thing our enzyme is gonna do is chitin 
goes into active site. Uh, goes into the active site. That's the active site. It's a box. Now, the active site is not passive. The active site has like walls and bits and stuff. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the walls. But what I'm going to draw is what Chitin does in the active site. You know, your one sugar is sitting there very happily in its nice chair confirmation, perfectly suited to its situation. It's having a good time. Your other sugar's been hit on the head and is being mugged. Um, I have run out of space, but the rest, nope, back. The rest of the polymer is going out that way. Um, and then you have an act group here. So first thing that the enzyme has done is this is the confirmation we want for reaction, right? Because now the lone pair on this oxygen is now anti-periplanar to this carbon oxygen bond. And what we've just done is we've locked it into this high energy confirmation. So even at 100 degrees in water, your chitin does not adopt this confirmation. It wants to stay chair chair. It always wants to be the lowest. It's easier to access this confirmation, but it's not populating this confirmation to any significant degree. But in the enzyme active site, it is now more stable to adopt this confirmation than to not do it. So this cost us energy. We just spent energy. This is not we have not lowered the energy of this molecule. We have raised the energy of this molecule. Okay, that that that's weird. We don't raise energies of things. So how do we pay for that? How does an enzyme pay for the cost of raising the energy of a starting material? ATP? No, uh, yes, it can. This is not going to be ATP. Um, you gained energy it, in a way. Does it itself stabilize more from the confirmation? Or? Right, okay, so you can gain some stability in the protein, but the protein, so the overall... The protein would have been more stable in its native form without that thing. Like it's it's going to adopt its most stable conformation. Now it might be slightly more stable with the, the sugar in there, but there's a bigger reason that drives almost all protein ligand interactions. The structure of the enzyme. Nope. So, much more okay. much more general. So charges <laughs> now we're just throwing words out <laughs> um okay so what we're focusing on here so thermodynamics has two terms uh entropy and enthalpy everything that we're drawing here is really enthalpic contrib contributions we're looking at energies delta h is really um we're, we're not and when we think about chemistry we often really think a lot about delta h we don't often think about delta S very much. So did we get an entropic benefit by having the ligand bind to the receptor? And where did that come from if we did? This is true of every enzyme. I don't care if it's a glucosidase or a phosphatase or a DNA polymerase, it's the same principle. What's different about the chitin not as bound to an enzyme besides its confirmation? It's fixed in position. Yep. So that actually cost us entropy. 
So that's going the wrong way, right? Because we've actually introduced order. So something has more than compensated for that. Okay, so when the chitin is not bound to the enzyme, it's surrounded by water. Your water is solving the chitin. It's trying to arrange itself into a solvation sphere around the chitin. And water doesn't want to be ordered. Water wants to be, well, okay, there, there's, water's kind of fractal. It's actually really, really cool trying to look at how um, water organizes itself in bulk solution because it's not random. It's, there is order in there. But when the water, but the water's really, you're breaking the ideal water, water, hydrogen bonds whenever you put anything into water. The water tries to organize around that solute to make it look a bit more like water. So one layer of water organizes around that, another layer of water organizes around that water to basically try and make that surface look more like bulk water. And you actually go out like five or six or seven layers of water. So we're talking on the order of several hundred to maybe a thousand water molecules are involved with dissolving every single molecule. And before, and they kind of all move together. So you have like a thousand water molecules that are tied up, dissolve, like solvating this chitin. Now suddenly it's buried in an enzyme binding pocket. And so suddenly all those water molecules that we're trying to organize around this area of the surface have been released. And you have this huge entropic benefit of desolvation. Desolvation is one of the most entropically beneficial things that can happen. So you've released all these water molecules. And so that's, that's how we paid for this increase is by the release of water molecules. So we always call this like hydrophobic collapse. Like we think about, yeah, of course, fat molecules all kind of gather together to make a, a phospholipid bilayer. But we're looking at it the wrong way there. It's not so much that the fat molecules have gathered together to make the phospholipid bilayer. It's that the water molecules have excluded the fat molecules from being in water, which leaves the fat molecules no choice but to bind together to make the phospholipid bilayer. So it's more that the water is squeezing things out than that the hydrophobic molecules are gathering together. Um, it's actually cool. You can see this when you make ice. Like if you if you try and freeze water, you'll see that the water will the pure water will freeze as the ice crystals, and the interfacial layers between ice crystals is where you'll find all the solutes, all the salts, all the orga dissolved organics. So you can actually if you do this really slowly and make ice crystals really slowly, you can actually remove an ice crystal from an impure water thing and the ice crystal itself will be completely pure water and your impurities will be left behind. It's actually a decent way to purify aqueous solutions. Anyways, a little bit of a digression. I like ice. So what we've done here now is we've locked this thing into a reactive conformation. So we have raised the energy of your starting material that lowers your activation energy because we've kind of paid some costs ahead of time because again we want to minimize this distance and so we've closed that distance and we paid for this increase by the release of water and that's what the enzyme can do that chemically uh we can't yet but we need to so the second thing the enzyme does is you know, we have sulfuric acid when we do the hydrolysis. So it's a really strong acid. So what do I mean when I say that an acid is strong? So why is sulfuric acid a strong acid, acetic acid, a weak acid? It uh, dissociates completely. Okay. So is that the reason the acid is strong? because it dissociates completely. I'm gonna say no. Yeah, I, I'm gonna say no too. 
Um, now it's part of it. It's completely part of it. So let's come I back guess. to what makes an acid strong. Dissociating completely plays into it. Yeah, taking back the proton makes the conjugate acid, uh, the, the conjugate base, I think I'm mixing the terms, but the tendency of the negative uh, part of the acid to take back the proton, the lower tendency makes it a better acid. I completely agree, but that doesn't tell me why it's a strong, like what a strong acid is. So I can say sulfuric acid is a strong acid. I can say... Um, because it has a weak uh, conjugate base. Okay, I yes, I agree. What, okay, so we, we can define a strong acid as something that has a small pKa, right? Yes. I think we're all comfortable yes. with that. What is the pKa? Like, what is a pKa? What, what physically is a pKa? It's the dissociation constant, so how easily it loses its proton or it donates its proton? Sure. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, we're kind of walking. So the, so the pKa of an acid at one molar equals its pH. So what's the pH? So something with a strong pKa is going to have a lower pKa, pH. What's, what's pH? Concentration of H plus. Right. So a strong acid is something that has a high concentration of H plus. That's it. That's all it is. And think about that for a second. Your reaction, all of the reactions we draw, we say H plus. Now, it doesn't matter if that H plus came from acetic acid or the H plus came from a sulfuric acid. If the H, H plus is dissociated, then it's H plus. It's hydronium, it's H plus. We're good. But we say sulfuric acid is a stronger acid of acetic acid, not because there's something special about the H plus coming from sulfuric acid, but because sulfuric acid is going to give us a much higher concentration of H plus than acetic acid. Now, your cell is running at pK, a pH of 6.8, more or less somewhere between 6.4 and 7.2, depending on the cell type. You do not have a high concentration of H+. So acid hydrolysis doesn't seem favorable. But the enzyme solves this problem by giving you basically an infinite concentration of H+, at the active site. This is glutamic acid number 35. What it's doing there is it's that's attached to the enzyme. The enzyme is in blue. So not only has the enzyme positioned the chitin to raise the energy of the starting material, the enzyme has now given us essentially an infinite concentration of H plus, even though the bulk concentration of H plus is really, really low. And that's not even freaking H plus, it's attached to a carboxylic acid, but it's positioned directly next to the oxygen we need it to be positioned to. And it can't freaking move. And so what we have here is a near, it might as well be H plus that can't move. Down here, the other residue we're going to be talking about is an aspartate residue that is thirty-two. Those numbers are just the numbers of the um, of the uh, residue in the enzyme. They don't matter. But what the enzyme's done is it's positioned the H plus right where we need it. It's forced the chitin into a more active conformation. So what we're doing now is reaction rate is always a function of concentration times the reaction constant. And we've just driven H plus concentration from quite low to basically infinite. And so now we're rate limited basically by the concentration of the chitin. How often can it occupy this site? Because it's there and maybe limited by whatever that rate constant is if it's kind of slow. But it's not because we know if you if this basically transfers, we've
we are going to basically almost instantly form the oxocarbenium. I'm going to, so you protonate, you make the oxocarbenium because it's perfectly positioned to do so because you've already twisted your sugar into form. This guy hasn't had any time to move, so he's still here. Sorry, this is this is more polymer. We're sort of breaking in the middle of the polymer here. Uh, now, because I didn't switch my colors, I have to switch over. So now the enzyme is going to be in red. And so our aspartate is now set up. Like one thing that can happen, of course, is this alcohol that we just released can come back in and remake the bond. Nothing's stopping it doing that. Like because of micro reversibility, that's a likely outcome. But we have this aspartate that is perfectly situated and it's negatively charged to make the new glycosyl linkage. I'll try and stay consistent. Our poor sugar is still twisted in the boat. Now it's in a much less favorable conformation to make a cleavage because it's not sitting axial. I just drawn everything in red blue. So now your sugar escapes. The other sugar leaves the active site and it frees this up. So that's what the we is. Uh, sugar leaves. So now what you have coming in is you have water. Now water is a pretty shitty nucleophile, but as it starts approaching the site, this is a decent leaving group because it's a carboxylate and you have an infinite concentration of base positioned at just the perfect site to grab a proton, which will generate this into hydroxide. And then a the hydroxide will come in and displace this to an SN2 mechanism. And for whatever reason, I started drawing this as a five-membered ring. Uh, I lost C6. I just kind of dropped C6. I'm really sorry. It's there. It didn't turn into rivals all of a sudden or something. It looks like there's an action there. Um, So what we've done there now is if we keep track of what's just happened to our enzyme, we're back to an O minus down on the aspartate. And the glutamate, which I've kind of run out of space to draw, is 
is back to being protonated. So we've actually restored the initial oxidation, initial protonation site we had at the enzyme going into this whole process. And if you notice, what we've effectively done is a double inversion. Now, the first mechanism is not Nessun2, it's Nessun1, but only one face is approachable by the aspartate because of the way this thing is held in. It's not a 50-50 shot like it normally is in an SN1. It only can attack one face because everything is locked into position because of the enzyme. So we spent, I spent some time talking about the raising of the energy of the starting material. The rate determining step for this is the basically the cleavage of this bond. And so what, what is the most stable thing in an enzyme? So it's an enzyme. What point on this curve does the enzyme bind Titus to? And what I mean by bind Titus to is at what point, at what point on that curve does the energy of the species is much lower when it's bound to the enzyme than when it's not bound to the enzyme. Where does the enzyme try and make the greatest change to stabilizing a molecule? That's true of every enzyme. The, the transition state? Yeah, perfect. So what this enzyme is doing here is it's facilitating the breakage of this bond. So there's probably something I haven't drawn here with the way this is sitting. So this oxygen is very, very close to this OH, which is really, really stabilizing it much more so. And as this bond breaks, it stabilizes it more and more and more compared to what it would be in solution. And there's probably, you know, some electrostatic interactions, which are stabilizing the presence of the oxocarbenium on this oxygen. So as the positive charge builds on an oxygen, it gets dissipated to the enzyme. So chitin in the enzyme. Transition state and enzyme. So now what we've done is we've reduced this huge activation barrier to a much smaller activation barrier. And I am not aware of a single enzyme that doesn't have both of these actions you actually destabilize the starting material. You lock the starting material into a less favorable conformation. And then you stabilize it as it transitions to the transition state, you stabilize that transition state and you make it much more stable than it would be without the enzyme. So you raise your starting material, you lower your transition state, you close your gap. I'm again, I think that is a universal truth of enzymes that those two processes always occur. And then what part of this molecule, what part of the sequence does the enzyme stabilize the least? Like what part of the end and what part of this whole thing does the state, does the enzyme normally bind the loosest to? The product? Yeah. Right, because you want the product to leave. So the product is so the starting material. Although you raise the energy of it, you're binding to it pretty tightly. Um, you bind to the transition state really tightly, and then you basically, hopefully, lose almost all your affinity, and your product can just drift out. So the other thing to note here is we started beta, we've ended beta. So what we did here was basically a double SN2. The first one wasn't technically an SN2, it was an SN1, but a stereospecific SN1. So it was an SN1, but only one stereochemical outcome, which isn't an SN1, but it was an SN1. And this is where, you know, language and naming of reactions just kind of falls apart. So you made an oxocarbenium, but you could only attack from one side. So a stereo, I don't know, a stereospecific SN1, I'm fine with that. It's an enzyme, they could do weird shit. The second one is a much more traditional SN2. But you do two SN2s in a chiral center, you're back to where you started. And that's what we see with non-inverting enzymes. Okay. 
Uh, John, sorry. Yeah. Um, a couple of people. I'm I'm just on campus, and a couple of people walked in. You might have said already, but um, how? Why? I guess I'm just confused as to why that's beta. Um, it's beta because I've twisted the chair. If you unfold it, it will be equatorial. Okay. It's it's not a it's 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 in a kind of a boat. It's not in a. So if I drop that <laughs> side down, then it's equatorial and beta. So it's like pseudo equatorial, but up. It's axial right here because it's in a. It's not in a chair. Okay. Sure. And I don't have a model kit on me. My model kit is in my office at work. But if you build a boat, the boat has like these two things are axial, on the end. But then you flip this side down and it becomes equatorial. And I don't think I can do anything better with finger guns. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Um, trust me, it's beta. <laughs> it's the same. It's the same molecule I drew on a previous slide with um, this chitin. It's it's this linkage here. I probably should have taken more space to draw that than I did. I just got really enthusiastic. Um, so for an inverting enzyme, I, I guess you really can't have two SN2s because then it would be non-inverting. And you can't have zero SN2s because it wouldn't be chemistry. It would be the starting material. So an inverting enzyme generally has very, very similar glycosidase active sites look the same. Except, so we're going to draw the same I'm just going to call this sugar. I'm not going to draw in the whole sugar, but it's the same idea. We could actually even have the same sugar. There are inverting enzymes for a chitin. This whole acid over here thing seemed kind of important. And so that is, that's still there. And it's always all, almost always a glutamic acid. I don't know why. And we still have the aspartic acid over here because nature never really wants to lose anything. But if we had the aspartic acid attack directly, then we would have to cleave the aspartic acid. And we would have an inverted, a non-inverting enzyme. So the way nature gets around this is let's just move the aspartic acid off a little bit. Now it's too far away to interact with that. So Let's follow this logic through. You transfer your, your very conveniently located OH. Does anyone want to help out this poor enzyme? So what's the universal reagent in life? It's freaking Water? everywhere. Water, exactly. This is perfectly spaced to fit a water molecule. So what we do there is a single SN2. And all we've done, all the, and this is, it's really cool. You look at the crystal structures of these glycosidases and, um, once you get used to looking at all these freaking coils and you actually select the right functions and you can see these, 
you see that the difference between a non-inverting and an inverting glycosidase is about two angstrom. That aspartate just slides two angstrom further out, and suddenly there's a space for a water molecule to fit in. And a water molecule fits in, and it does its magic. And it looks like it was designed that way. And I guess, you know, evolution's had, you know, four and a half billion years to do this and so on. I can be jealous. This is beautiful. Like this is just, I wish I could do this selectively. And then the other thing that we really haven't discussed is because it, it's kind of beyond the scope of anything that we can draw reasonably and we'd have to get out computers and start looking at things is each of the enzymes, at this point, we have two sugars. We got the two sugar molecules. And so the enzyme is designed to only fit those two specific sugars. So it's trying to cleave, this enzyme will only cleave a 1,3 glycosidic bond between two chitin, like two N-acetyl glucoses. If you have anything else there, it's not gonna fit into that active site. So you don't have the N-acetyl group, it won't bind properly, it won't join into the active site. If you have galactose instead, You'll have an OH that's probably banging into some wall and so it won't fit. So if either one of them is modified, the enzyme doesn't work because it can't get into the active site. So you have this, and I don't know, like I know you guys know all this. It's just, and I know all this, and I, I, I know it intellectually, but you sit back and you just think about how amazing it is that you have this three-dimensional shape of space that fits only has like recognition for two very different sizes while doing that it's able to force one of these guys into a much higher conformational state so it's much higher energy and much more cleavable it's then able to position an acid perfectly so you have essentially an infinite concentration of acid and even sulfuric acid can't compete with an infinite concentration of acid and then you have this other residue that's either positioned a water molecule away or in the perfect position to do that follow-up SM2. And I take sugar, dump in water, add acid. And it's like, <laughs> like I, ugh, bang, rocks together. Like it just, it feels, I don't know why I bother. I get really depressed. This is why I'm not a biochemist. <laughs> so, those are the catabolic enzymes. Let's talk about the anabolic enzymes. Let's talk about making this stuff. Okay. So, if I want to make a sugar, oh no. I want to do this in the lab. Well, you're getting ready for the exam. So you'd first protect all the other OHs. You would then basically take this guy, the retro, sorry, there should be a retrosynthesis arrow. Sorry, I'm not sure if everyone's seen these. Does everyone know what a retrosynthesis arrow means? Is anyone uncertain? Now is the time to ask. Okay, so you would have had a leaving group here. You would have this protecting groups. To have that OH, this would be all protecting groups. And then you would mix, and if you're going forward, you would mix these with some activator or promoter, let's say. And we just spent weeks, a month, talking about different ways to do this. Okay, so nature doesn't have protecting groups. Our promoters are things like, you know, TMS triflate. Nature doesn't have TMS triflate. Our leading groups are things like anomeric bromides, thio, epoxides, glycals. Nature does have glycals, but it doesn't make epoxides with them. So nature doesn't have any of those leaving groups we've got. But the chemistry is the same. They're, it's going to do the same chemistry. It's just, it chooses different tools. So, you know, 
I think a few classes ago, I said the reason there are so many different ways to make like different glycosidic strategies is because none of them works very well. And it's, it's a truism of chemistry. If there's a lot of ways to do something. It's because none of them work very well. Um, so in the class of fuck you chemist, nature only has one leaving group. He uses only one, it only needs one, and it is beta now. This is one of those things where you that you kind of think, okay, intelligent design is not a thing. because this is uracil. This is diphosphate. This is uracil diphosphate. Or UDP. I'm just going to abbreviate it as UDP. This is nature's leaving group. It is a stupid leaving group that uracil is completely unnecessary. Like, come on, stick a methyl group on the end for fuck's sake. But no, it sticks a uracil on there. Why? Because it's got that, right? You know, um, and if, if there's one thing that, that you learn, it's that evolution is MacGyver, it just, you know, sticks whatever it's got together. And I have no idea if that reference means anything to any of you. And MacGyver's before my time too, but, you know, making things out of like duct tape and paper clips. So, it's, this is a stupid ass leaving group. You would never design a leaving group like this. Uh, but it's the only one nature uses and it works much better than anything we've got because it's like the yields are all 100% and complete selectivity. And that's because enzymes are miraculous. The reagents suck, the end, but the catalysts are really, really good. So you can actually do this. You can take this molecule. So this is glucose UDP. You can take glucose UDP. Treat it with TMS triflate. Because again, our Lewis acids suck. And a sugar, more glucose. And you will get sucrose, which is the glucose disaccharide. So you can use UDP as a promoter if you like. I wouldn't. Nobody would. It would be a pain in the ass to make. But nature, of course, has got some good enzymes to do that. And it's got UDP floating around. Now it just snaps it onto the end of a sugar and boom, it's off and away. So how does it do this? So you take a sugar, any sugar, any monosaccharide anyways. And it, for the most part, you are going to work always with the monosaccharide on this. Um, these enzymes don't, um, again, when we're thinking chemically, you might just, if you needed to make a four linear, like four sugars linearly, you got a bunch of ways to do that. You could do it linearly, you attach sugar one to sugar two, then add sugar three, then add sugar four. Or what you could do is you could pre-attach sugar one and two, pre-attach sugar three and four and snap them together. Uh, and we would probably actually do that second way because it's fewer steps. It's more efficient to do it that way. It's convergent. Um, nature doesn't do that. It just keeps slapping on monosaccharides at the end. But you take that and you treat that with hexokinase. So hexokinase. So this would be glucose hexokinase. Though the hexokinases are very promiscuous and will just kind of kinase any sugar. So what do kinases do? Like in general, what, what are kinases? Is anyone? I know at least one of Ashley and Kirsten is a biochemist. 
but I can't remember which one of you. Do they put things together? I just is it? I think it's phos yes. phosphate groups or yeah. something. Yeah, they just slap phosphate groups on things. So you put a phosphate group on something. So this is actually kind of non-specific, and it does exactly what you think it's going to do. It goes for the primary alcohol. because that is the most nucleophilic alcohol. And it's kind of nice occasionally when, you know, the kind of chemistry that we do kind of teams up with biology, it's like, oh, that makes sense. You added a phosphate to the primary alcohol. Now, if you remember, if we're gonna make UDP, we don't want a phosphate on the primary alcohol. We want a phosphate on the anomeric alcohol. So that's where a rec, uh, an enzyme called phosphoglucomutase. is a mutase. So mutases are a subform of isomerases. They isomerize things. And it is a phosphomutase. So it's moving phosphate groups around on glucose. So it is both a kinase and a phosphatase. What that means is it phosphorylates the anomeric position and it cleaves a phosphatase, it cleaves the C6 phosphate. So it actually, it doesn't move that phosphate around, it takes off that phosphate and sticks another one on the anomeric position. Again, it's kind of got like two sites in its active site. One strips a phosphate, one adds a phosphate. Then when the glucose leaves, they move the phosphate across so they're set up for the next glucose. It's like a conveyor belt of enzyme hell. So we make that. Now, you know, glycosylation is not free. It's a pain he asked for us to do. Pain he asked for biology to do. And so what it does now is a new enzyme. called UTP phosphorylase. Comes into play, and what is that? Well, uracil, we drew it earlier. I ran out of space. Any inorganic chemists in the audience, please don't flay me for my bond angles. I am going to be very forgiving of bond angles on, well, of things like that. I'm not going to be forgiving of axial versus equatorial on chairs. That better be freaking clear. But everything else, I'm going to be very forgiving of angles. Um, because I'm not holding you to a higher standard than I hold myself. So what is the, so you have a nucleophile here. It's a shitty ass nucleophile. I would never want to use this as a nucleophile chemically. It's a crappy nucleophile. But again, enzymes, magic, active sites, bending things out of conformation. Where's the best electrophile on UTP? You know what? That's going to be a phosphorus. So you've got a red phosphorus, a blue phosphorus, and a purple phosphorus. So I guess the question there is, what's the best leaving group? We attack the purple phosphorus. Our leaving group is going to be um, sort of a diphosphate attached to uracil. It's okay. 
actually nothing wrong with that. Um, it mustn't happen for some reason I do not understand. If we attach, attack the blue phosphorus, our leaving group is going to be a monophosphate. The purple one's going to leave. That's okay, but then we'll have two negative charges on one phosphorus. If we attack the red phosphorus, then we lose both the purple and the blue phosphorus. They're going to wander off as pyrophosphate or diphosphate. And you'll have two negative charges, but they'll be spread apart in space because they're going to be spaced out by the two phosphoruses. And that's better. You're delocalizing charge. You're keeping negative charges further from each other. So what this guy wants to attack is the red phosphorus. And that gives us glucose UDP plus This is called pyrophosphate or PPI. I'm never going to call PPI uh, except when I write papers on it. But uh, just you might, if you ever see it, that's what it is. And I, you'll have, I don't even know why I'm bothering mentioning it because you're never going to remember that because it's a stupid detail. But you got this glucose UDP. So again, um, Somebody started this whole conversation by saying ATP, which is really, uh, that was how enzymes were paying for the cost of having this thing bind. Um, that was mostly desolvation, but here we haven't used ATP, but we've used UTP. Again, we're using an energy source. So we're consuming energy to make this highly active glucose with a leaving group on it. And we're now set up to have the next nucleophile come in and do that glycosyl transferase. So what happens with that is it should not surprise, I've got, yes, we've got enough time just to draw, this is actually perfectly timed. We've got enough time to draw the glycosyl transferase mechanism. So, so far there's been no glycosyl transferases at all. We've just made nature's glycosyl bromide, essentially. So it shouldn't surprise you that glycosyl transferases tend to force your poor glucose molecule into a reactive conformation. Again, we're raising the energy of the starting material. That helps us because that lowers the activation energy because we're raising up something, so we're lowering the total distance. And it shouldn't surprise you that we're going to help this guy out by having an infinite concentration of acid, by having a glutamic acid residue. There it is again. It's always fucking glutamic acid. Perfectly positioned really close to that OH, that oxygen. So we're starting to make a bond there. We're starting to get a delta plus. We're starting to donate in a lot of electron density into this, and we're starting to break this bond. So we're seeing everything that we expect to see in normal glycosylation. And then, of course, you have your incoming sugar which is held to a very specific orientation by the rest of the enzyme. Uh, for some reason, my notes have it as a galactose. Uh, oh, I, I understand why, because I probably just was like, this is too crowded over here, so I'm going to do a galactose. And sorry, I'm just going to redo the enzyme in red. And this has got an OH on it. But again, shouldn't be too surprising 
that you're going to have a carboxylic acid on the enzyme positioned nice and close to that OH. So that can start pulling off that OH, which is going to start liberating this O minus. And then you're going to have an O minus really near the anomeric center. And an anomeric center is becoming very, very delta plus right now because this guy's making an OH bond there and it's all locked into place and everything's locked into place and nothing can move and nothing has any options. And bam. It must be really claustrophobic inside an enzyme active site. I don't think I'd be happy in there. Plus UDP leaving group. And then you have to exchange your acids as are going to exchange. Now glycosyl transferase is always inverting. So if you start with beta UDP, you're going to get the alpha product. If you start with alpha UDP, you're going to get the beta product. Earlier, I think I said you always have beta UDP. I misspoke. Um, you can have either alpha or beta UDP. It, the enzyme I showed was always going to get beta, but you have different enzymes that do the same chemistry that always give alpha, and it's all the way that where the sugar is positioned relative to the UTP, because of course it is. Um, yeah. So, glycosidases, we've got inverting and non-inverting. The inverting do 1SN2, a direct SN2. The non and they use a water bridge to do the inversion, so the water is a nucleophile. The non-inverting do an SN2 with the enzyme, uh, a residue on the enzyme makes a covalent bond to the sugar. And then water comes in and breaks that covalent bond. And then for the glycosyl transferases, we have... They're always inverting. We're always using UDP as our leaving group. Um, we're always making it the same way. And the selectivity is completely coming from which sugar can fit into the enzyme. And then which enzyme is currently present is controlled by gene regulation. And the gene regulation is probably controlled by carbohydrate signals on the surface of the cell that are interacting with receptors that are GPCR receptors that are activating G proteins that are controlling the nuclear expression patterns. And those are controlled by which sugars were made. And I clearly don't understand life. So I'm gonna leave enzymes there. Um, next class, we're writing an exam. And the class after that, we're going to talk a little bit about lectins and some of the, this really rise and transition state mimics. So this rises from the whole idea that enzymes bind transition states best. So if you're going to design an inhibitor for an enzyme, what you want to do is you want your inhibitor to look like the transition state. And the transition states for a lot of what we just saw today, these glycosyl transferases and glycosidases, they're going through effectively oxocarbeniums. And so you want your inhibitor to look like an oxocarbenium. The problem is oxocarbeniums aren't stable. So how do you make an inhibitor that looks like an oxocarbenium when oxocarbeniums aren't stable? So we'll talk about that in two classes once we are done our midterm. Good luck studying, good luck solving the problems. Um, I have to go pick some of the questions to put on to the midterm. I'm Thank you. Uh, John, just before I go, um, just Mo came in and we got we got the TH, uh, one of the cannabinoids.